Well, hello there and welcome to Jesus Did What? We have an amazing testimony for you today uh, from a friend that I've just met recently. And when I heard his testimony, I thought, wow, everyone needs to hear this. So today I want to introduce you to Peter Vandenberg, who pastors in Illinois, in Fremont, Illinois. And uh, we're so excited to have him with us today. Um, welcome, Patrick. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's good to see you. Yeah, and to you too. And of course, uh, you've written um, a, a book called A Knock on the Door, which shares about your testimony that people can get on Amazon. And I'm so excited about this story because what Jesus did for you is big. And he can do big things for anyone. It doesn't matter how how cruel life has been to you, no matter what you've done, no matter what wrong choices you've made, the blood of Jesus Christ can redeem you and give you a brand new life. And of course, Patrick, that's what you represent. Uh, your testimony is powerful. So why don't you begin to share because you, um, you're going to share, you know, the, the, the title of this program is Jesus and the Murderer, because before coming to know Jesus, that's that's who you were. You were labeled yeah. as that uh, by the law, and you paid, uh, you know, a price for it. You you yeah. spent time paying for that, and so let's share, um, you know, a little bit about your story, about how your whole story began, your upbringing, uh, the kind of things that you were involved in, and what Jesus did for you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I I was raised in Vacaville, California. Uh, in a Catholic family, Irish Catholic family, which uh, had a long history of drunk. And growing up, I'm the youngest of eight. My two oldest siblings died even before I was born. Um, and my older siblings uh, introduced me to marijuana when I was in third grade. And, um, you know, I didn't start doing drugs regularly, obviously, at that young age, but I was introduced to them. And growing up in uh, California, you know, going to high school, um, everybody was doing uh, drugs and uh, drinking and partying and just seemed to be the normal uh, thing to do. No one thought anything of it. And by the time I graduated high school, I was a full-blown um, alcoholic and a drug addict um, and didn't even realize it um, because I still went to school. I still played sports. Um, God had given me a, um, a real athletic ability uh, when I was younger. And, and so I excelled at those kind of things. But the one thing that I, that I was always looking for in life was love. I didn't know it at the time, but like many people who are lost and don't know what true love is, uh, the love of God, they uh, fill their lives with all kinds of bondages. And uh, that was me. And when I graduated from high school in 1985, I thought, you know, if, if I'm want to do drugs, the, the best way that I can do it, um, that is to start dealing drugs. And that way I'll have drugs at my disposal and I'll be making money. And so I started uh, dealing drugs right out of high school. And that led to a, a worse scenario because I got involved in a clientele uh, that is not very pleasurable and ended up becoming a drug enforcer uh, for a local drug dealer. And I was going into uh, the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward, San Jose, and uh, getting large quantities of drugs and bringing them out to the suburbs and then distributing them and selling them all because I just wanted money, wanted fun, uh, one, and I was a drug addict. Uh, but the one thing growing up that I never feared man, never feared circumstances, uh, but I feared death. It was the one thing that just every time I heard of somebody dying, every time that um, somebody close to me died, it just captured me and just paralyzed me um, because I was so afraid of, of dying myself. And seven days before I graduated high school, I had a, a childhood friend, one of my best friends named Tony that uh, uh, was killed in a, a car accident. He fell asleep at the wheel, I ended up dying. And, and I just remember being paralyzed by that. And I was looking for love. And, and so two years after I had graduated, um, you know, in the 80s, that's when the big uh, gang movement started happening in California. 
And I was invited to go to a party and I knew that there uh, was going to be gang activity there. And I said, I don't, I don't I'm not going to go to that party. And I ended up going to a different location and I was partying with a smaller group of people. And the next morning, I got a phone call that another one of my best friends, childhood friends, had been stabbed to death at the other party the night before that I was supposed to be at. And I had stayed up all night, had done drugs, had been drinking, had been partying, and I, um, that, that capture of death came on me again. And I finally, um, because of the influence of drugs, I, I finally said, I'm going to go find out what death is all about. And I left the apartment I was at, and with all intentions, I'm going to go kill myself. And the place that I was staying in at the time, I knew that there was a gun there. So I left the apartment of where I had, um, had been partying. Uh, it was a short walk of just a couple of miles. And I walked to this apartment and I said, I'm going to kill myself. And I went and got the gun and it was a shotgun and I put the shells in it. And I, I put the gun right up to my chin. I was sitting on the edge of the bed about to pull the trigger. And um, there was a knock on the door. And I didn't know who it was, but I stepped out into the hallway and I was holding the gun by my side and I was screaming at the individual through the door. They were trying to say something back to me. I couldn't really understand them. And as I was screaming at them, I jerked and the gun went off. And it shot through the door and I went over to the door and I opened the door up. And one of my friends who I had been partying with the night before was standing there and had a shotgun blast in his chest. And I brought him in and I laid him down on the carpet and I'm in a state of craziness now. And the neighbor had come out because they'd heard the, the gun go off. They called 911. And I ran from the apartment. And right next to the apartment complex, there was a creek. There was a bridge there. And I was underneath the bridge in the creek, sitting in the creek in my underwear because I was just so out of my mind. And I started to cry. And about 10 minutes later, I heard the sirens coming and uh, the police came and someone must have told them they saw me where I ran to. And the police came to the creek with their guns drawn and, you know, started to give me instructions and basically said, if you move, we're going to blow your head off. And uh, so I climbed up the creek bed bank and I, um, they arrested me and took me to jail. And um, I had already I had already had some run ins with the law prior to that on some s smaller things. And when they took me to jail, um, I wasn't saved. I wasn't a praying man by any means. But I said a prayer and I said, God, if you're real and if you spare Mike's life, Mike was my friend who I had accidentally shot. I said, I'll serve you. And so um, I, I didn't know what happened to Mike. Three days later, I went to court. Um, they arraigned me, my mother bailed me out of jail. When I got into the car, I said, mom, I said, what happened to Mike? And, and she said, um, he's alive. He's at the hospital. He's alive. So in three days, God had answered both of those prayers that gotten me out and had spared Mike's life. Well, I knew I was in serious trouble and I was like, you know what? This is not the lifestyle I want to live. So I need to make some life changes. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to stop hanging around the drug dealers. I'm going to stop dealing drugs. I'm going to stop partying. I enrolled in college, said I got to do something positive with my life. But I never really accepted Christ in, into my life. I didn't, I didn't really serve him. I was trying to make the, the right decisions. This went on um, for about eight months. And then I, I went through my court proceedings and they finally sentenced me to a year in the county jail. Um, for assault with a deadly weapon. And I served that year and I got out and I said, okay, it's time for me to put all of this behind me. I'm gonna do what's right. And I'm, I'm gonna make um, better decisions. And, and I was on a decent path at that point. It was shortly after I'd gotten out that um, my mother had been having some uh, medical problems and the doctors had called all of us into the hospital room, my dad and all of the siblings and they had finally discovered uh, what was wrong with her. And she had uh, terminal brain cancer. She had a tumor about the size of a man's fist. And the doctor just said, there's nothing that we can do. She's going to die. And again, for me, um, I thought the only person at that time in my life that really loved me was my mom. I felt like my dad abandoned me. All my siblings abandoned me. My coaches abandoned me. Everybody, friends abandoned me. 
but my mom was the one who stood by me. And when the doctor said she's going to die, I interpreted his words as if now no one loves you. No one on the earth loves you because the one person who does love you isn't going to be here. And I left that hospital room and I said, life's not worth living anymore. And I started to go back into my old lifestyle. And it reminds me of the, the scriptures that I know now, you know, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, where it says that, you know, a spirit leaves a man and it goes to try to find a, a dry place. And if it can't find a place to rest, it comes back to the state of that man. And that man is worse off than he was in the beginning. Well, that was me because I left that hospital room and I was, I was literally trying to OD or I was putting myself in a situation where somebody would kill me. And neither one of those things happened. And I, um, again, this went on for probably about the next year. And one night, um, my dad had called me and he said, uh, he goes, you want to see your mother alive? You need to come right now. And I went and she was in a convalescent home. She had lost all faculties, couldn't communicate. And I knew it was the last time I was going to see her. And I just asked for forgiveness. I said, mom, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I love you. And I'm so sorry for being a terrible son. And I, I just want you to forgive me. And and I just was trying to make peace with her. And I left that um, convalescent home and I just said, I got to go get drunk because that was my go-to. You know, when you don't know how to manage, when you don't have the peace of the Holy Spirit, it, you go to these other things. And so um, I left there and I went and got drunk. And um, it was about midnight after we had been drinking all evening. Um, one of my friends said that he wanted to ride home and I said, I'll drive you home. And so there was um, myself and then there was a young lady that was in the front seat. And then my friend was in the back seat and we took some country roads because I knew that I was drunk. And as we're driving and we're having a good time and I, I come to this country road and at the bottom of the road, there's a big bend in the road and, and I missed it. And I went off the road and I landed in, landed in a ditch. And when the car came to a stop, I got out and I walked around to the other side. And when I opened the door, uh, Michelle was unconscious and she was limp. She fell right out and Troy, my friend, I said, stay with her and I need to go get some help. And I, I ran down the road to the nearest home, which was about a quarter mile. And I started banging on the door. And this elderly couple came to the door and they and I yelled through the door because they wouldn't open the door. And I just said, hey, there's been an automobile accident. Somebody seriously hurt. Call the police, call an ambulance. And then I ran back to the um, scene of the accident. And because they were off the road and in the ditch and it was on a country road, it was dark. They, the, it would have been very easy for the ambulance or the police to drive by them. So I was standing in the middle of the road so they would see me. And I started pacing back and forth. And I began to curse God and I began to blame God. I said, God, you're supposed to be good. You're supposed to be loving. You're supposed to be caring. You know, where are you? Why'd my friend Tony die? Why'd my friend Doug die and get stabbed to death? Why'd Mike have to get hurt? Why is now Michelle, my, my mom's dying. I, I said, this, it's just, everything is tragic. And I, I said, you're not good. You're not loving. And I used to wear a gold cross and I ripped it off my neck and I went to throw it into the field as if to say, God, I want nothing to do with you. And as I went to throw it, I heard the audible voice of God speak to me on that road. I mean, we're on a country road and there's nobody else around. And I heard God's booming voice and he said one word to me. And he said it like a loving father that was disciplining a brat son. And he said, no. And I didn't have language for it at the time, but I have language now, but the fear of God came into me and I put the cross in my pocket and God spoke to me again and he said the same word, but this time he said it like a loving father that needed to hold a hurting son. And he goes, no. And again, I don't have language back then, but I have language for it now. And all I can say is that the peace of God came over me. It was just this sense of like, everything's gonna be okay. Well, it was shortly after that, that a police car um, came around the corner. They actually almost ran me over because, I, again, I was in the middle of the road. They stopped, and I directed them, and I said, hey, the accident's over there. One of the officers went to administer um, first aid to Michelle. The other officer began to uh, interview me and did a field sobriety test, which I failed. And he said, Pat, he goes, listen, I got to arrest you. Don't give me any trouble. And I just turned around. I put my hands behind my back. Um, 
put me in the car, took me to the hospital. I was handcuffed to the handicap rail in the hospital room and I uh, had been there for a while. And uh, an officer comes in, slaps me across the face and says, you murderer, Michelle just died. And that was the how I had gotten the news that in the accident that Michelle had died. So this time when I went to jail, I didn't ask for to get out. I didn't ask for anything other than God, I wanna be different. And I said, I heard your voice. I know you're real, but I don't know you. I just wanna be different. I, I'm tired of being afraid of dying. I'm tired of all the pain and, and misery around me. I just wanna be different. I went to court this time and because I was already a convicted felon, the first charge that they charged me with was first, tier, first degree murder, 15 years to life. And I said, God, I don't care if I have to spend every day of my, my life in jail, I just wanna be different. And I picked up a Bible and uh, I don't even know if I ever read the Bible before. I know we had gone to church as, as a family when I was a boy, but I don't know if I'd ever read the Bible for myself. And I said, God, I, I know you're real. I don't know who you are, but I guess I'm gonna find you in the Bible. And I started reading the Bible. Didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at the time, but I was trying. And um, over a period of about four months, I kept going to court periodically and they kept reducing the charges till finally I was convicted of vehicular manslaughter without gross negligence. And I was sentenced to three years in the California state prison. And I thought, you know what? I, I probably should have done a lot more time than that, but I was very grateful. And so I went to prison and when I got to prison, I can tell all kinds of stories that, uh, you know, the, the first day I was on the yard, the, um, I walk out on the yard and I had been in consolatory confinement because they do all kinds of evaluating tests when you go into prison. And I finally got out of that and I got to go onto the yard. And the first day I'm on the yard and um, I'm tying my shoes and I hear this boom, 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 boom. I hear a gun going off and everybody hits the ground, they're face down on the ground. And I'm looking around because first, I don't know the protocol. And it's first. And then finally I heard the guard that was above me in the tower start screaming at me to get my face on the ground. So I fall on the ground and I look across the yard and I see this guy, he's like flopping around. And then he just goes still. About 10 minutes later, they wheel the gurney out, take, pick the body up, put him on the gurney, they wheel him back in, announce on the thing, all clear. Everybody gets up and goes about their business as if that happens every day. I, f I found out that he had an epileptic seizure and he crossed over the boundary lines and hit the fence. And when he hit the fence, they shot him. First day I'm on the yard and I'm like, is this what prison is? Oh. And so I go back to um, heading to my, my cell and I have a, the Hells Angels come up to me and say, hits me on chest, goes, yeah, you're pretty big. He goes, we need to get you on our side. And I didn't say anything, but I'm thinking to myself, I ain't on anybody's side. I'm not getting involved. So I just want to do my time and get out of here. Well, after I had been there for about 30 days at that reception center, which was in my hometown of Vacaville, my name was plastered all over the local news and the local newspaper, star athlete going to prison. Um, just my name drug through the mud, my family name drug through the mud, just horrifying for them. Um, just humbling for me of just going from a place of being an all-star to now a prisoner. So I get over to where I'm gonna do my time and I um, go to the, my assigned cell and I take my possessions out and I put my Bible up on my bunk. And again, I'm not born again yet, but when I put the, the Bible up on the bunk, the, my cellmate says, uh, hey, are, are, are you a Christian? And I wasn't, but I was like, well, yeah. And he's like, well, praise God. He goes, so am I, let me introduce you to all the Christians. So I had just gotten to here and God had set me up and with this Christian uh, bunkie. That night I went to my very first Bible study. And again, I was ignorant, I didn't know anything. And uh, the guy leading the Bible study said, turn to the, to the book of, I don't even know which one it was, but I just looked at him like, I don't even know where that is. And he flipped the pages for me. He said, we're gonna read right here. I said, okay. Well, they asked me if um, I wanted to go to uh, 
it was a couple of weeks later, wanted to go to a special meeting that they were having a guest from the outside that was going to come into the prison. And I, they said, do you want to go? I said, it's limited seating, but we can get you in there. And I said, yeah. So I said, I, I definitely want to go. And so I go to the special meeting. I'd never been in a church like that before. They were praising God. They were lifting their hands. They were clapping. Everybody seemed to be happy. You know, and I was like, what is this? I said, I've never been in an environment like this. This is new to me. And um, I said, but I like it. I said, but, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle myself here. And when the preacher got up to preach, he started preaching about sin and hell and being separated from God and punishment and, and all of the things about your, what happens when you don't have a relationship with God. And, uh, and I'm sitting there going, that's me. He's talking about me. I'm in that seat. That, I don't know God. And so I'm, I'm going to hell. And he's talking about eternal death. And I'm like, I'm afraid of death. And now you're talking about it's going to be eternal death. And I was just like, well, I don't know that. And at the end of his sermon, he said, he goes, I'm going to come back next month. And he goes, I'm going to give you the answer. And I said, okay. And he, and then he said, in the meantime, I want you to look up these scriptures. And again, I didn't know the Bible, but I said, I got a month. I go, I can ask and I can have people help me. So I started looking up those scriptures and all the scriptures that he had us look up had to do with the love of God and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and, and what Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection. And and God was priming my heart. And so the next month when he came back, I sat on the edge of the, the row knowing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to this. And so he does a review and says, you know, this is what I said last month, but I want to give you the answer. And he starts talking about the price that Jesus paid. He talked about, you know, the, the, the penalty of the cross and, and the love of God and, and, and how we're accepted and we're loved. And when he said, you are loved just the way you are and you are accepted just the way you are and all your sins are, well, can be forgiven and you can have eternal life and you don't have to be afraid of death anymore. I literally, I interrupted the meeting. I interrupted the sermon. I, I stood up where I was at and I said, sir, I said, please forgive me, but I said, you don't understand how much pain I've caused. You don't know what I have done. I said, I don't believe that God can forgive me for that. He goes, no, that's the beauty of God's love. God will forgive every sin. God will forgive you for anything that you have done. And he will accept you into his family and he will give you eternal life. And I said, sir, I said, if that message is true, I said, not only will I surrender my life right now, I said, I will serve him all the days of my life. And I ran that short distance in that chapel and I fell down on my knees at that altar and I started weeping like a baby. I started crying and weeping and just like, um, just pouring my life out to God and started confessing my sins and just started saying, God, help me. You know, and, and I felt literally like demons leaving. Like uh, literally I could feel the, the demon of anger and violence and drugs and alcohol and immorality, all of this stuff. I just felt it leaving me. And after about 15 minutes of doing that, that same peace that I felt on the road, I felt again in my heart. And I knew at that moment, I said, I'm a different man. I said, I, I'm different. Something happened to me. And again, I didn't have the language for it. I didn't have the biblical understanding for it, but I, I knew in my heart that I was different. And I got up from that altar. We left the service. I went back to my building and uh, I walked right into the building. I'd only been saved about 30 minutes. And I walked right into the building. And at that time in that building, um, there was about 280 guys. I walked right into the center that evening. I lifted my hands like this. And I shouted at the top of my lungs, I say tonight! I just shouted. I said, like, I say tonight! I gave my life to Jesus! And everyone heard it.
And they were like, what is this crazy guy doing? And I couldn't stop telling people. I was like, let me tell you what Jesus did for me, set me free. I said, I'm, I'm saved. I said, the man of God preached and said, I was saved. I'm saved. And I was just telling everybody. And I began to be known on the yard and everybody said, that's the happy prisoner. Everybody, yeah, that got a happy prisoner because I just was so full of joy. I was so happy because I was forgiven. I had eternal life. And, and now I read the Bible and I was like, oh, it was came alive. Yeah. I had the Holy wow. Spirit. I, could, I couldn't get enough. I just kept reading the Bible. I kept digesting the Bible. I was spending six, eight hours a day just reading the Bible. Every scripture was life to me. I would test myself. I would write scriptures on a three by five card, and then I would write the reference on the back. And every night I would test myself of like where the reference is and what that scripture was. And I was just digesting the word of God in me. And I tell Patrick, people all the time. Yes. Patrick, a miracle, the miracle of rebirth took place Amen. in the prison where Amen. Jesus went face to face with a murderer and yes. gave life and washed away all the past. And I want to point out to our audience, Patrick, that there was a difference from the time that you started to pursue Jesus yes. and had like a level of belief within your mind and when it actually was fully formed in you. And I just feel like there's some viewers watching right now um, and I just want to, I just want to make an appeal to you right now, because you might be watching and you're thinking, well, yeah, I mean, I believe in Jesus. I mean, um, my family went to church. I grew up in Sunday school, but you see growing up in church and going to Sunday school or even acknowledging that Jesus, you know, is the savior of the world and died on the cross doesn't make you his own. It doesn't make you what we call born again. Jesus said to a very religious man who was very, um, very well studied in the scripture to Nicodemus, he said um, that in order to enter the kingdom, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, just, I mean, what? How does that happen? Can't go back in your mother's womb and get born again. Um, he said, no, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, what you just heard in Patrick's testimony was that he had this this belief in god from from childhood because of his catholic upbringing but that didn't make him god's own that didn't that that didn't give him new life okay religion doesn't give you new life and then he got encountered by god and he reached out but he still hadn't received but when that moment came he knew the difference and i believe that some of you are watching right now and you don't have that assurance. You might even be like Patrick, afraid of death. And you don't have that assurance yet that you belong to Jesus and that you have a brand new life and all your sins are forgiven. Um, because when Jesus comes in, he literally, he literally washes away all the sin. And he gives you a brand new life. And that's what you heard in the testimony was that miracle of rebirth that Patrick knew he was new. That's why he could shout about Jesus. When you're truly born again, you can't keep quiet about it. Right. I can't keep quiet about Jesus. He's just so good. And That's he forgave right. me of so much. He gave me a brand new life. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And that's what he wants to give you right now. Yes. That's you want. It, it, it's just in a moment of time when he comes into your life. If you want to surrender to him right now, you can. You don't have to wait until, you know, the devil takes you so down into a pit that you are arrested, thrown in jail, or bad things happen to you. You, you don't have to wait for that. Right now, you can have a brand new life. Jesus can come in and give you that brand new life. And if you want that new life right now, we're going to hear some more from Patrick in a moment. But if you want that new life, I want you to write in the comments section, I need Jesus. Amen. Because he's going to read it. We're going to read it. He's going to read it. Yeah. Angels in heaven are going to read it. And everyone's going to say, he needs Jesus. She needs Jesus. And Jesus will come. 
and he will come into your life and he will make you a brand new person because he's not a respecter of persons. Right. He's not just looking for, for really good minded people or people who do good deeds. No, he went after a murderer. He was with Patrick all of his life and he refused right. to leave him. Even in his darkest hour, he was there reaching out to him and he is reaching out to you right now because he loves you with a love that you can't even comprehend yet. And he wants to come right inside you. And you know what? We're going to pray for you in a moment. We're going to pray for you for Jesus to come into your heart and for him to make you a brand new person. It is so beautiful to belong to him. And if you've been walking in ways that are not good maybe you like patrick are using drugs maybe you are getting drunk maybe you are, are are doing things out there that are not good i'm telling you every time you give yourself over to those things it just gives the devil more power to destroy you jesus said in the book of john chapter 10 verse 10 he said the thief meaning the devil he comes to steal to kill and to destroy that's what the devil wants to do in your life but Jesus said, but I came that you would have life in its glory, in its abundance, in its beauty. That's what Jesus wants to give you. And you might think, but I don't deserve it. None of us do. That's the beauty of, that's why it's good news. You can't even work to earn it. There's nothing you can do to make yourself worthy enough to earn this. It is a gift of God's love for you. He is so crazy in love with you and he wants you to be his very own. And when you become his own and enter the family, his family, oh my goodness, everything changes. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's just like all of life lights up because he is in it. That's right. So if you want to receive Jesus as your personal savior and Lord right now, I want you to write in the comment section, I need Jesus. We're gonna hear from Patrick in a bit a little bit more about his story because that was only the beginning that was only the beginning and life got so good after that it got so glorious after that god called him and is using him powerfully and is blessing him in every area of his life he's being blessed and that's going to happen to you too and maybe you're watching this right now and you think wow I used to have a relationship with Jesus, but I threw it away. I let other things grab my attention. And now I'm standing here just dull and I and I don't have vibrant faith. I kind of I kind of let it go dusty. I don't even know if God's here anymore. Well, he is, and that's why you're watching this. He called you to watch this so that you could return to him. And if that's you, just write in this comment section, I need Jesus. I need Jesus because right now you can return to him and it'll be better than ever. And he doesn't punish you. He doesn't say, oh man, you, you once knew me and then you chucked me out. So now you're going to be down on the, down on the, the uh, chain there. No, he brings you right back into his heart. Like just the story of like the prodigal son yeah. who went away and he came back and his father was looking for him. And his father ran out to meet him and hugged him and put his cloak on him and, and killed the fatted calf. That's what God wants to do for you. You might say, yes, but Patricia, Patrick, you don't know all that I've done. God knows. And he still says, I love you with an everlasting yeah. love. And it will not be withdrawn from you. Right in the subject line right now. Come on. I need Jesus because we're going to pray for you. And a miracle is going to take place. A miracle of love is going to enter you and give you life. Right. A really beautiful life. Just right. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. You're reaching out. A number of you have already done it. And I know that there's more of you that need Jesus right now. And you might be a mother or a father watching this. And maybe you have a child who is wayward. Maybe you have a child in prison. Maybe you have a child who's addicted to drugs. Maybe you have a child who's in trouble with the law. God hears the agony of your heart and your intercession is going to be met. And you know what? Your child or your loved one, the person you care about right now in those dark places, all they need is one encounter with the Lord. That's all. 
And we're going to pray for that today, too. Yes. And so you might want to write in the subject line, my child needs Jesus or my friend needs Jesus, because we're going to include them in our prayer today. And God's going to go after them. He will go after them because we pray. I tell you, a great harvest is coming in. And yes. Patrick, I'm just wondering if you could pray for these precious people. We already have a number that have written, um, I need Jesus. Um, you know, they, they just want him and need him so much, just like you did. Could you lead them in prayer to receive Jesus as their savior? Absolutely. Thank you for that. And um, just wherever you're at in your watch, just say, Father, forgive me. I have sinned. I, I've chosen my own way. Uh, I've blown it. Whatever language that uh, words that you you can use, just say, I need help and I need forgiveness. And to say, I repent of my sins. And I ask Jesus to come into my heart and to wash me clean and to be my Lord and to be my Savior. Now, if you confessed him and you believe in your heart, the Bible says you're born again. You have eternal life. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If you were to die, you are going to spend eternity with Jesus. And so that is your choice. I'm, I'm so happy that you have responded. And let me, can I just pray for those that are, are doing that? That Father, Absolutely. in the name of Jesus, that everybody who is responding, even right now, Father, that the good seed of your word would be on the good soil of their heart. And that, God, I pray that they would not have any self-condemnation, for you don't condemn them but you love and accept them just like you did for, with me. And God, I pray that they would just have that same peace that surpasses all understanding in their own lives, in their hearts and in their minds, that they are cleansed, they're forgiven, and they're accepted, and they have eternal life because of what you did on the cross and the resurrection. Thank you for being such a great and loving Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's so awesome. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that when one person turns to Jesus, that yeah. all of heaven has a party. Yeah. Your name has been written in the yeah. book of life and all the angels are excited. There's witness in heaven of what you've done and you are, you are brought into the family. So you're not alone with Jesus. You have a family. I'm your sister. Patrick is your brother. Yeah. I mean, you've got brothers and sisters all over the world. Everyone who knows Jesus. And so it's so beautiful. And I know that this is only the beginning for you. And I want to encourage you to write me at Jesus at PatriciaKing.com, right? Jesus at PatriciaKing.com. And I want to give you some material to help you uh, get strong in your faith and to help you understand what God has for you and what's happened to you. And so if you could write me at Jesus at PatriciaKing.com, and we'll have a team that prays for you as well. And also, we have a website uh, called Jesus, or Finding Jesus, rather, FindingJesus.me. Okay, and on that website, I have a few little videos they are just a few minutes long each that help you understand what happened to you and what God has for you, how you can have relationship with him, how you can get filled with the Holy Spirit, how you can pray and read your Bible and and find a place to fellowship. And so that'll help you tremendously. And you, there's about seven videos up there right now. And it'll only take you about an hour to watch them all. And it'll give you such a good start on your new walk in the Lord. So that's called FindingJesus.me. If you go there, you'll find out more information. We're so excited for you, all of you who have come to know the Lord. And Father, we just pray for those who have loved ones that they are concerned yeah. about. And we know that... All you need to do is give them one encounter. And so we're asking for that. Go to them and give them one encounter. One encounter where they gaze upon you, where they hear your voice, where they know that you're calling them, where they know your love. And Lord, we seal them into your heart and into salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And all of you who are praying for your loved ones, we want you to have confidence that God is good. And even, you know, especially for those of you who are praying for family members, it says in, in, in the Bible, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved, you and your house. God's after your family, and yes. he is not going to stop going after them until 
they bow their knee and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. So Patrick, as we're just uh, finishing up here, I want you to share a little bit about your book and how, how our viewers can get it. And also just maybe a little bit about, about your life after you, you gave it to Jesus. Sure. Um, well, my book is called A Knock on the Door, and we just had the second edition is out on uh, Kindle on, on Amazon that just happened uh, two days ago. You can get the e-reader. The actual printed for the second edition won't be available until next week, and then you'll be able to order it. You can just put, punch in Patrick Vandenberg or knock on the door, and then um, you will be able to, to read it. And uh, we like to, um, I go into prisons and jails, you know, uh, when they will come available prior to COVID. Uh, I would go into prisons and jails and, and we would distribute the books for free because, you know, they can't pay for them. So anybody that buys a book uh, and supports that, then it, it ends up that we'll be able to give books away for free into the county jails and into the prison systems. And um, and so my wife and I, we, we planted a church 15 years ago in Freeport, Illinois. It's called the Father's House. And uh, we, uh, again, are just down to earth and loving people. And we do a lot of community outreaches with food and clothing. And, and we have a women's shelter that we uh, house women. Um, and then we do a lot of missions work. We've done a, some church planting stuff in uh, Brazil, Pakistan, and in Kenya. And uh, we are reaching those nations uh, you know, as I travel over there and uh, do a lot of training and teaching um, and different things of the apostolic and the prophetic and prayer. And so we're re so, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's how, how can they find you, Patrick, so that they can get more information on your ministry? They can go to the website. It's TFH for the Father's House, Freeport.org. TFH Freeport.org. And awesome. uh, yeah, you'll be able to scroll through that whole website and it has all the information that you will need. Uh, it's so awesome what God's done in your life because there you were like, you know, tracking with the devil and getting involved in all that dark stuff. And now it's just light upon light upon light upon light yeah. and filling, filling the earth with the goodness of God. And that can happen for anyone. God is not a respecter of persons and he loves everyone with that everlasting love. It's so beautiful. Thank sure. you so much, Patrick, for sharing on our program today. And for those of you that are watching, again, I just want to encourage you to get his book and you might want to buy a whole bunch of books and give them out. It's a great evangelism tool, right? When you can share someone's testimony. Yeah. And at the same time, it helps them get books into the prison. So that's awesome. But also I would like to um, share with you about an upcoming uh, seminar that we have coming. For those of you that are watching this live um, in uh, 2021, um, it, on May the 7th and May the 8th, we are hosting um, a conference with Leif Hetland uh, on the orphan spirit, on, on being healed from the damage that that spirit does. And so I'd love to have you join us. That's going to be um, on May 7th and 8th out here in Maricopa, but it will be online as well. So register for that. It's free. We're, our ministry is covering all the expenses so that we can get as many people watching that as possible, because that's one of the reasons why there's so much crime in the world today, why there's so many people struggling, because they don't know their identity as, as, as God's very beloved children, okay? So, so that is on May the 7th and 8th, the orphan spirit. And then um, on May the 20th to the 23rd, we're hosting a revival school because we know revival is coming and we wanna train and equip you in revival. And so sign up for that school. Uh, ben and Jody Hughes will be with us on that. And of course, I'll be there and Robert and Francisco. We're going to have blowout revival meetings at night. We'd love to have you here in Maricopa for that school so that you can get an impartation of revival, get trained, get positioned for everything that God wants to do in these coming days. He's looking for revivalists to carry his torch in this hour, and he's calling you to that. So sign up for that school. Um, there, we also have it online, but but you'll want to be there if you at all can be there in person so sign up for that and um or sign up for the online version of it if if, if you need to as well and also would like to invite you 
to partner with our ministry um, or to bless the ministry if we've been a blessing to you. We want to continue to preach the gospel, to get the gospel out, um, to help uh, uh, all the different uh, people that we reach out to. We have um, a department called Voice for Victims where we help uh, victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse, spiritual abuse, emotional abuse. Uh, we have all kinds of different um, outreaches that we um, engage in. So if you would like to help support us, uh, we would love your partnership. If you've been enjoying our teachings and everything, your partnership means a lot to us or just maybe a one-time generous donation. We really appreciate uh, that more than you could know. So you could go on Patricia King. Dot com and of course we always welcome your prayers but i do have a special project right now that i'd like to invite you to sew into it is my 40th year of ministry next month we celebrate that and the month after my 70th year of life so it's a big year for me 70th birthday and 40 year anniversary of, of full-time ministry and uh, people were asking me what would you like for your birthday i thought i don't need a thing i am so blessed i just i just want to be a blessing to others i want to give a gift to others and so it was on my heart to buy a house so we bought a house called the house of hope and it is uh to put people in there that that need um to be empowered in life that need help and so uh we bought the house and uh our our first uh, resident has just moved in um, and it is a single mother with two children, a beautiful family that is living there now. So that is that is my birthday present. It is a gift that is going to live on and on and on. So our ministry um, is uh, looking after that. We do have a bridge loan on that house until the end of June, and we believe it's going to be completely paid for by the end of June. So anything that you can do to sow into that. Uh, would be amazing. So again, go on patriciaking.com and uh, go to the donate page and, and there's options for you in any nation that you're from to be able to donate to that. So thank you so much. And thank you, Patrick. And do you have anything that you'd like to share just as we uh, close out this session? I just want to say it was so nice to meet you. And also thank you so much for, for having me on. And, and uh, you took a risk. You didn't really know me and uh, and I just appreciate that and I appreciate all that you, you and your ministry have done and um, and are doing um, and again I, I just echo what she just said about support her ministry and support the projects that they're doing uh, that they're good soil and sow your seed into their ministry and bless them abundantly and uh, I, I am I'm just very grateful um, for you and thank you for the opportunity I really appreciate it and I hope your people were blessed as well. Thank you. And I appreciate you too, Patrick. And we met um, just for our viewers. Um, we met just um, last weekend up in Minneapolis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was doing a conference with my uh, good friends and Nelson's there. And, uh, and uh, Craig actually prophesied over you and yeah. then brought you into the lunchroom. So we were sitting at the same table at lunch and that's when I heard his testimony and oh my goodness, I thought, you know, the whole world needs to hear this testimony. <laughs> so I know I have a new friendship here. I look forward yes. to building relationship with yeah. you, Patrick. We're so proud Absolutely. of you and everything that you're doing to advance the kingdom worldwide and keep up the good work and God bless you. And to uh, all of you that are watching, we'll see you again next time with more testimony of what Jesus is doing and has done in people's lives. He is amazing. He is awesome. And don't forget for every single one of you, he loves you with yes, an God. everlasting love. He really, really does. Amen. God bless. God bless.